Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Now, we're talking about that. We're going to talk about this morning. We're talking about submitting to the will of God. There's too much in the church. See, there's a lot of people who want to go to church where it's, it's fun. They want to go to church where it's happy. They want to be in part of the happy, clappy church. They want to go to the hula hoop church where they, they, they play beach music and have hula hoops. I'm just kind of exaggerating now. It's just a fun party. Well, the, the church, listen, the church should bring us life. The church should bring us revelation. The church should bring things that build victorious living into our lives. But the church is not a party. It is a place we get discipled. Amen. Amen. There's one of the fastest growing quote, churches in America down near Charlotte, and what they put on their website is this. If you've come here to get discipled, you've come to the wrong place. The head of the church, anybody know who the head of the church is? The Lord Jesus Christ said, go into all the world and make disciples of men. And you're going to put on your website, if you've come to be discipled, you're in the wrong place? Then who are you? Who's your head? Because the head said, disciple them. Amen. So we're going to talk about submitting to the will of God. Let me say this. We, I'm, I'm a charismatic old Pentecostal guy who came over on the Word of Faith, went to Rainbow Bible Training Center, sat under Dad Hagen, went through the whole, you know, we, 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 confession, confession beeper, cast the confession, bad confession devil out of you. I mean, I went through the whole thing. Been there for all of it. Been there for the laugh in every service. You know, I've been through all of it. Now, I never did get in that laugh in every service. I'd like, you know, I've been in a service where there was holy laughter, but you can't do that three, three times a day, six weeks in every service. God's bigger than that. I've been in, I've been, I, was sat, I sat in a dad's ministry for, now we call him dad, if, you, if you're any connection to Rainbow and, and, and a lot of time, uh, they, they, he, that's something they all kind of, they used to call PC Nelson, Dad Nelson. You know? called uh, William Seymour. They called him Daddy Seymour back in the Azusa Street Revival. It's just a term of affection for spiritual uh, fathers. Dad was a spiritual father to me. Hallelujah. But I watched him. So you get into a service. One service is wild, what we call Holy Ghost. Every service should be a Holy Ghost service, whether you're teaching the Word or, or having manifestations of the Spirit. It's still a Holy Ghost service. You know, there's no less anointing on the teaching of the Word than there is a running around the church service. Amen. It's just a different order of that particular service or a different manifestation for that service. So if we're jumping the pews and rolling under them and hanging from the, and I, we, I was Pentecostal, we were always thought, everybody said we rolled out the front doors of the church steps and hung from the chandeliers and stuff. And maybe we did. Anyway, <laughs> proud of it too. All right? Uh, but you come right back and teach the word, that's just as anointed. So it's a, it's a Holy Ghost service. Why? Because the Holy Spirit should be always be in charge of what's going on. Amen? Amen? So, uh, but I'd be in services where, you know, they had that, that crazy, wild, you know, running, laughing. I mean, everybody in the spirit laid out all over the place, you know, here and there. And come back next night, Dad Hagen, somebody, and, and everybody, somebody trying to get it stirred up again. They're going to make it happen. I'm going to make it happen. One lady one night sounded like the Wicked Witch of the West out there in the congregation. <laughs> I thought, my God, that's the devil. <laughs> There's no Holy Ghost without one. <laughs> Dad leaned up on the platform. He just sat there for a minute. He just finally said, open your Bibles to Mark, the 11th chapter. I taught Mark 11, 23 and 24. Preached, taught 45 minutes, closed up and said, go home, see y'all tomorrow night. See? So I've been in all the crazy stuff. I've been in the normal, I've been in the, the real stuff. I've been in all, I've been around it all. Hallelujah. Seen, seen the things of God. Hallelujah. And, and, and the one thing is, with charismatics, we, we don't like to submit. We, we, you know, charismatics are one of the worst submission groups there have ever been. Now, I understand part of the reason, because a lot of those people, why they were charismatics and not Pentecostals is, they came out of the Episcopal, they came out of the Catholic, they came out of the Lutherans, they came out of the, all the liturgical churches, and went and got into these, what we call charismatic churches, because they were free from all that bondage of liturgy, and, you know, the way they, they you know, the responsive readings and all that stuff, they got out of all that, and they got free, and they, wanted, they didn't want to get back into another denomination. The problem is, you can get too free trying to be free. How can you be too free? When you use your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, you're too free. Hello? See, when it becomes, it becomes an excuse to give in to your flesh, it's too free. So we found out over the years that getting charismatics or, or people in our circles, as it were, to submit is a difficult thing. 
Why? Because they'll just pack up and go down the road to somebody else. Joe, Joe Blow's church down at, you know, on that side of town over there. Hello? I, mean, I can't use that because one of our other Raymond guys is Joe. So I think mean, uh, Jesse, Jesse Wesley's church. You know, they just started a new church, and you'll walk in, and they'll go, whoa, you just, where'd you come from? Faith and victory, that's all right, we love you, we, 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 we preach better word than they do. Come on over here. Well, the, you, what you don't know is they left mad because the pastor told them that they could not, you know, play spoons in the middle of preaching. You ever hear, hear, see anybody play spoons? Take two spoons, put them back to back, and do like this? We used to have brothers, brother, yep. Well, Brother Amen, back in Faith of Victory in Greenville, used to play the spoons during worship, but he'd get carried away sometimes outside of worship. Had to finally talk to him. You know? You know, we had, um, had people here last week. My, I'm, I'm having a hard time on my microphone today. Glory to God. Um, had people here last week, you know, wanting to prophesy over people in our church. Well, where do you go to church? I just follow so-and-so around. Well, you know, you don't have anybody just go, go, watching over you. You can go around and pro start prophesying to everybody in the church. I believe, in, I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe they're real. I believe they're manifest in the church today. But I believe there's an order to it, and I believe it needs to be anointed. And you need to be having some straightness in your life, not some looney tune. All right. So we're going to talk about submitting. When we begin to talk about submission, now, now I'm going to spend a little more time on, on your personal life of submitting to, to the will of God and controlling your flesh than I am on submitting to authority in the church, okay? That's not really my point, but I kind of just de dove into it a little bit on the front end. Let's talk about this. Controlling your flesh. Everybody say, control my flesh. You're going to have to do that to submit to the will of God. You cannot submit to the will of God running around screaming, I'm under grace. I can do anything I want to do because I'm under grace. You might be under grace, but grace does not allow you to do whatever you want to do. Paul wrote to the church and said, shall we continue, uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And what was his rhetorical answer? God forbid. God forbid. How shall we who are dead to sin live any longer therein? Jude wrote and said the people have entered in, spied out the liberty, and turned the grace of God into licentiousness. That's not a good word. Okay? It, it means wantonness. It means living in your flesh. The excess of what people are doing. See, you're, you could take Ephesians 1 through 3 and teach the grace of God, who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, where we belong in Christ, what God's done for us. I mean that we're no longer under the, you know, the spirit of the world and so forth and so on. And leave out chapters 4, 5, and 6 and you'll get messed up. Why? Because chapter 4, verse 1 starts out and says this. Wherefore, what? Because of all these things or who you are in Christ, where you're seated in Christ, what God's done in you. Wherefore, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He didn't say because you're in the grace you're going to do it. He said you walk. So what's that mean? That means we're going to have to submit to the will of God. Submitting to the will of God is not always easy. Uh, let's look at a couple of things. First Peter chapter 5. My glasses, are, um, I'm, I got new glasses and they're, and they're kind of messing with me a little bit. I'm trying to get used to them. So just they're not lined up exactly where the other ones were. They told me they wouldn't be, so I have to kind of get adjusted to them. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, what? That he may exalt you when? In due time. There are too many Christians running around, I mean, you know, demanding God do this and God do that on their timetable when God didn't want it done. You know, and last week, one of those points made was, you know, you know we, we don't want to get out in front of God's timing. I believe in that. You know, you hear the prosperity message, oh, God wants you rich, and you go out and buy a Lamborghini. You can't afford the Lamborghini, but you want to show your prosperity. Well, that's just stupid. You're way out ahead of the plan of God. You can't even believe God for a pair of new socks, and you're going, you, can, you won't even be able to put the gas in the Lamborghini. Hello? Had one preacher, have uh, one ministry come one time, and they said they wanted to come, and we had said, "Well, we want you to come." And, and and in between the time they told us that and the time we contacted them to have them come, they got their own airplane. And the person on the, you know, they're in California, and the person said, "Well, we got our own airplane now." And, uh, and Dr. So and So flies, and we bring you know several members of a staff, and so uh, you know we, we need for you to play for the fuel. Now I'm thinking that, what's that? Whoa, 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 whoa! If you got the faith to get the plane. Where's your faith to get the fuel? 
Because you know what the fuel cost was going to be? $4,700 to fly from California to here and do a three-day meeting. Now, before I even have him open his mouth and take up the first offering, we've got about uh, uh, $1,533 a day in expenses. That ain't even the hotel, the food, or anything. And I, I said, praise the Lord. I'll get back to you maybe. I can't, you know, we're not paying $4,700. Then you, did you get out in front of God? Well, it sounded like it to me. Because you could have flown here 10 times first class from the West Coast and spent, you know, uh, $500 round trip each time. I could have had you come in 10 times before we paid for that one trip. So that's getting out in front and then, and then expect, you know, saying, you know, the blessing of the Lord, the bless, God bless me with an airplane. Well, let him bless you with the jet fuel. Amen. Instead of putting off the burden on the church. Now, if you agree to it, fine. But I didn't agree to it. I, we, not, you know, we, we recommend you get someone else to share the expenses. That's $2,250. You know? So we, we, we do things sometimes. Now, I'm saying that about that. But, you know, we can do things and go out and bless ourselves with a car, bless ourselves with this, bless ourselves, and then blame the Lord and expect the Lord to pay, take care of and pay for it. We need to get and find what God's will is in things. Now, God doesn't want, it's not that God doesn't want you to have a car, but a Lamborghini may be excessive. Hello. Now, I don't blame you if you don't ever want a Prius. That's not my kind of car. You know, little, little, little electronic motor, you know. I, I want something that, you know, goes. Hello. Hallelujah. But Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he'll exalt you in. In due season. That means that we submit to God and God's will. Some things we have to pray about to find out God's will. Things are just flat out in the word. Lord, do you want me to witness to anybody? Yeah! Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Whatever. You don't need to pray about that. Then you might need to pray about going to Africa, but you don't need to pray about who you, does God want you to witness. There's no scripture that says thou shalt go to Africa. You may, not be, you may not be a ministry gift in that sense, but you're called to witness. So you're called to be a witness to people. Amen. So he says, uh, humble yourself. We have to stay humble before the Lord. I know we teach prosperity. I know we teach health and healing. I know we teach blessings of God. I know that we teach God wants you to have stuff. <clears throat> That's all true. But we have to stay humble and not get out to where we, we just kind of live our life. The, me the message, the message is greater than the creator. Now, I heard a minister say this uh, a, few, a few years ago, and, I, and somebody I highly respect, I still respect them, but I highly respect it. And they said, you know, if God wasn't real and Jesus wasn't real and the Bible wasn't real, I'd still live this way because it works. Don't I live by faith? You couldn't live that way because it doesn't work outside of the principles of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I thought it was one of the worst messages ever sent to anybody in the body of Christ. You cannot live this way outside of your relationship with God, the Father, the, the, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's the teacher. He reminds you. He anoints the Word. The Word comes and brings faith. Amen? You know, God's dealt to every man the measure of faith. It came from God. You can't, if God wasn't real, you wouldn't have it. Amen? So we need to stay humble before the Lord. Don't get so arrogant about how great your faith is and how much you know about God or about, about living this way, about how you, you can get prosperity and all this kind of stuff. You forget God. Stay humble. Uh, next verse, we go down to James chapter 4, verse 7. We'll back up. Verse 6. He, gives, he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, James 4, 6, but gives grace unto the humble. Now, let me say this. If you're arrogant, cocky, you don't need to submit, you don't need to obey, you don't need to go to church, you don't need to tithe, you don't need to give because you're under grace, you're not. How do you know? God gives grace to the humble. He doesn't give it to the arrogant. All right, get your Nerf guns out and shoot me. It's still true. God resists the proud. He didn't bless the proud. He resists them. Well, number one, God's not going to share his glory with any man. 
When it's all said and done, you're not going to be able to go out and talk about how great your faith was. You're going to talk about the God, the great God of your faith. Amen. Amen? How great he is. We got, we're going to have to look up to him and say, you know, without him. You know, Milan wrote that song for Elvis. Elvis recorded, without him, I would be dying. May, may Milan Rich, Elvis recorded it. And then after Elvis recorded it, every Christian music guy in the country back in the 60s recorded it. Because if Elvis did it, we got to do it. You know, and, and then royalties just kept coming into mile. He said he, he hadn't he sung it on anything, and he's just getting the money from it. Hallelujah. This is the next verse. So he gives what grace to who? God gives grace to who? What did Peter tell us to do? Humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Keep a right attitude. <coughs> God is going to ask you to do things you don't want to do. He's just going to do it. Why? Sometimes it'll be a test to see if you'll obey him. Now, I didn't say he's going to ask you to sin. I didn't say he's going to ask you to, you know, but he will ask you to do things you don't want to do. That went over big. Why? Well, God, the Bible doesn't say that we're led by good circumstances. We're led by the Holy Spirit. And if you think every time you're led by the Holy Spirit, you're going to have nothing but good circumstances in the course of things, uh, you're sadly mistaken. Ask Paul. Paul was heading over into Asia when the Spirit forbid, forbid him to go over there. He stopped him and Barnabas, had a dream, heard a man over in Macedonia saying, come over unto us. That's over where Ephesus is. Got over there, got the, got the backs beaten, thrown in jail. But the Ephesian jailer became the first pastor of that Ephesus church. And it's God, in, Paul ended up establishing a, a mighty work in Ephesus. Hallelujah. Now, was it God's plan for him to get beat? No. But it was God's plan for him to go there. And you're going to encounter stuff when you follow God. You're going to be persecuted. Jesus said you'll get persecuted. Sometimes you're going to get persecuted in obeying God. You know, I can imagine, you know, Barnabas sitting there. Hey, Paul. Yeah, Barnabas. Can you tell me something? Yeah. What did you have to eat the night you had the vision? Man, I'm going to tell you, I had uh, pizza with pepperoni and extra Italian sausage. He said, I thought so. That's one of them pizza dreams. Had to be. Because if you were hearing from God, we wouldn't be here. But the fact of the matter was, they were led by God there. They did encounter trouble. But on the other side, the Bible says Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the shame of the cross. See, sometimes we teach in such a way, <clears throat> Dad Hagen used to say this, sometimes we leave people with the impression that they're going to go through life on flowery beds of ease, never going to have any trouble, never going to encounter anything bad. No. Nope. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand when? When everything's hunky-dory. When Doris Day is out there singing, K sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Or Tiny Tim's out there singing, tiptoe through the tulips. Do you anybody want to hear the Tiny Tim invitation this morning? Tiptoe through the tulips. Brother when they left me. Ooh, it's from Miss Vicky. Tiptoe through the tulips with me. Okay, thank you, son. <clears throat> we get this idea that the life of faith will never encounter any trouble. And that we're going to submit to the will of God only when there's no trouble. And honey, you're going to have to submit to the will of God when there's all kinds of trouble. When everything, that's when you really be, you need to be submitted to God. You need to be obeying God. You need to be doing what God said to do, even if your flesh doesn't want to do it. Hallelujah. Janie and I, um, before we had any children, we were in Faith and Victory Church in Greenville. And, uh, and um, Pastor Zabowski's brother, Dave, is, he, was a Raymond, he graduated from Raymond the year before I, I went. <clears throat> but he had gone to the Pentecostal Holiness Church. It was part of their missions, uh, missions organization. And had just come out of the mission field out of Haiti. Had gone into Haiti and worked there for a, a year or two. He ministered there and established churches in Haiti. And um, he was, and we were, we were, uh, he came in, him and Pastor Zabowski and myself and the, and the assistant, other assistant pastor at church were heading up to uh, um, Lester Summerall's first world missions conference, about 80, about 83 or so. Now, T.L. Osborne and Daisy Osborne were the, were the keynote speakers or the guest speakers and, and Brother Summerall. That's who was sharing during this three-day meeting. And um, Dave got to talking about, he was getting ready to spearhead a 
plant, church plant team in Mexico City, Mexico for the Pentecostal Holiness Church. Their plan was to establish 25 churches in the city of Mexico City and so forth and so on. He got to talking about, you know, and, and, and Pastor Zawowski and him. Ed, hey, you ought to come with us. You ought to come. And so we got to pray. And I, I thought, well, the, the Lord does want me to go, you know. Praise so we're going to pack up and head to Mexico. I told Janie, it, it didn't go as easy with Janie as it did with me. Janie's going, I don't want to go. But the Lord wants us to go. I don't want to go. But the Lord, I, I mean, we took me three months to pray that woman into the will of God. Lord, you got to, finally after, after arguing with her for a couple months, I finally said, Lord, you got to deal with her. I can't do anything about it. <clears throat> and um, they were having a big missions conference down, down in South Carolina, Lake City or something, uh, down, down in the eastern part of South Carolina, upper, upper South Carolina. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but a big PH. There were like 5,000 people there for this big missions conference for the PH Church. And we went down there to meet uh, the head of the missions board for the PH Church about, about Mexico City. So because Janie, Janie had finally got to the point, I will go. But see, one of, the, one, of the one of the things you had to do to go to Mexico City on the mission field of the PH Church is you had to go to London, England for a 10-week mission school. Well, Janie had never been out of, hardly out of North Carolina, much less across the pond. And um, so we're, we're sitting there, and, um, you know, we, we, we went to talk to him because, you know, we want to go, but Janie doesn't want to go to London. And, and he says, you've got to go to London. That's just a requirement. So I take Janie off to the side. She's crying. I don't want to go. Okay, I'll go. All right, she finally... And then she made, she switched over, I'll go. So I go back home. She's going to start raising money. You know, go to our pastor. He's going to give us $100 a month. I think. I'm working in the church. I've been, you know, I get 100 bucks. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, I got to think, come on now. Um, anyway, so, so we, and then I get, I'm praying. And all of a sudden I hear the Lord say, I didn't want you to go in the first place. What? Are you kidding me? Finally got the woman where she'll go, and you didn't want, yeah, I just wanted you to be willing to go. And then he reminded me of the story of Brother Hagin. About the man in his church, he had a man in the church, he got down to, he, he backslided every, about every two months. Stay out of church several months. He'd come back to an altar dinner, special service, something, get down there, oh God, oh, repent. And then, then the Lord would start dealing with him about going to Africa. He'd get up and run out and leave. Wouldn't come back for three more months. Finally, one time he's in a meeting. He's sitting down there. He's like, all right, Lord, I'll go. I'll go to Africa. And here the Lord say, I didn't want you to go. I just wanted you to be willing to go. He could have missed all those years of not serving the Lord by just going ahead and submitting to the will of God and finding out what God wanted in the first place. <clears throat> well, and this wasn't like, you know, I'm, I'm looking for an out. It just kind of came to me after we'd already said we're going. So if I called my pastor, I said, I got to talk to you. Drove over. I said, what's going on? I said, well, I'm having some questions about, uh, about uh, going to Mexico City. My wife's been screaming in my ear for two months. You're not supposed to go. He wouldn't say anything. Why? Because, see, you've got to hear from heaven. And when you submit to the will of God, you've got to know God's speaking and not somebody else. Now, listen, some counselors are safety in the multitude of counselors, but make sure your counselors are hearing from heaven. And they're not just blowing wind up your skirt. Telling you what you want to hear. Because people tell you what you want to hear. And your buddies aren't really the best, best sounding board. Amen. Why? Because they're more messed up than you sometimes. That's true. Get your girlfriends together. Well, the pastor said this. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you what I think. Well, I don't want to know what you think. You want to have somebody who hears out of heaven. And knows God. Amen. And um, so I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what the Lord told me after you, you tell me. I said, if you tell me not to go, we won't go. I'm submitting to your counsel. He said, don't. He didn't even flinch. Don't go. Okay. See, the Lord told me that he didn't want me to go. He just wanted me to be will willing to go. Why? And here's why. Because God can't use you where you are if you won't go where he says go. Yes, he can't. No, he can't. Why? Because you're not submitted. You haven't humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God so he can exalt you in due season if he's telling you to do something. Now, this can be in ministry. This can be in natural things. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm moving to so-and-so. Why? Because there's a job over there paying me $100 a month more. Yeah, but is there a church over there? I don't know. We, 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 you know we're going to follow the money. The, the love of money is the root of all evil. You better watch it. You'll lose your family. You'll lose everything. 
There might be $100 a month over there and there might be a Jezebel too. Yeah. Waiting to seduce you and destroy your marriage and destroy your family. But you got $100 a month and when it's all over, what you got? Nothing. Because that $100 a month ain't going to be doodly squat when alimony bills start showing up. And child support. Hope she was that good. <laughs> Hello? See, if you, you got to stay submitted to the will of God. You got to follow God. Hello? Amen? Where was I? Okay. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. What's that mean? There are going to be things God wants you to do, and there's things that God says to do. There's things in God's Word that tells you to do that your flesh don't want to do. He says, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Look over, if you will, to Judges, the 14th chapter. Anybody know what's over in Judges 14? Who's this the story of? Samson. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman, Lord help us, in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman <coughs> in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. What did he say? I went down there. And my flesh got all stirred up. She was a she was a harlot. How do you know she's a harlot? She's she's on. Well, let's read here. Then then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among thy people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samuel Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She pleaseth me well. Now look, all he's done is seen her. How can he know she pleases him? She pleased his eyeballs. Her beauty persuaded him that she was the right woman for him. Now look, I just got this this morning. I had the script, I had the, 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 the skeleton yesterday while I was riding around meditating on, on submitting to the will of God. I got everything else this morning while I was over in Winston. I already preached this once. Hallelujah. So, that, you know, anyway. So he, he, he got his eyeballs on her. Let me say something here. Do you know the Bible has something to say about pretty women? And it's not the song by Roy Orbison or whatever his name is. Is that it? Pretty woman walking down the street. Pretty woman. She'll take you to hell tonight. Pretty woman. I mean, ain't no mercy. I'm telling you, Proverbs has a lot to say about it. Talk about the lips of strange women. Talk about women, you know. We, we have to watch that we don't let our flesh determine whether or not we're going to submit to the will of God. Well, how is this not the will of God? His father and mother knew. That, well, I'm sorry, I didn't finish reading. And Samuel said to his father, get her, she pleased me well. Verse 4. But his father and his mother knew not. Um. Do not that it was the Lord that he sought an occasion with the, against the Philistines at the time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. God wanted him to have battles with the Philistines. He did not want him marrying that woman. Are you here? He wanted him to have occasions to deal with the Philistines. He didn't, it wasn't the woman. Now remember, if we go ready to read the rest of this story, you'll find out that what, <clears throat> that what Samson did was he ended up getting her for a wife. And then what happens? As soon as she had him hooked, then her people, her uncircumcised people, started using her as a way to get to Samson because he's killed a lion, he's killed people. I mean, they can't, they can't do anything with him. And, start, and then she, she starts telling him, <clears throat> and, and listen, folks, men, women, I, you just watch out for this. If you love me, you will. When you're walking in a God of love, you don't have to use, you, if you love me, you'll do such and such. And so she started telling him, you know, what's the power, what's the secret of your strength? And, and he said, I can't tell you. She says, look, if you love me, batted them big old eyelashes, you know, with Maybelline on them, you know? Don't, know, don't have any idea what she was wearing. Probably won't a whole lot. Hello? Because she's seducing him. If you love me, you'll tell me. And he lied to her several times. Oh, if you, you know, if, if you put this around me, I'll do this. Or if you do that, I'll do this. You know, and every time she do it, she said, the Philistines be upon the He hopped up, broke it all off, went out there and beat them all up. But finally, when she got him to the point that she had control over him, 
He, she got him drunk, batted the, batted the eyelashes at him. I'm, I'm just improvising a little bit here. You know, maybe they were baby blues. Ding, 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 ding. Like one of them Disney cartoons. Eyeballs this big. And he said, if you cut my hair, I'll lose my strength. So they, she got him asleep, shore, cut his hair, bound him, and said, the Philistines be upon me. And he did not know the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. See, God didn't want him with that woman in the first place. Why? He's unequally yoked. Didn't want him with her in the first place. But he did it anyway. And then the Spirit of the Lord departed from him. They came, they took him, they poked his eyeballs out, hooked him up to a grist mill, and they just walked by and made fun of him every day as he stood there, the mighty one, the mighty one, the mighty one. And then at the end, again, you see, God can restore. But I'm going to tell you something. The end of Samson's life where he got restored was not God's plan for his life. He missed out. Now, they put it between the pillars of the temple. He pushed it out, killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his whole life. But I am going to tell you, had Samson followed God, he'd have killed more than ever, ever we have recorded of, and he wouldn't have had to do it dying himself. The, rest, the restoration of God, thank God for it. God can restore. But Samson's life was never to have been one of his eyes out, made fun of, and having to kill more as he died. His, he was to be the champion of Israel and, and to walk in that Nazarene vow and to do things God called him to do and live a whole long life doing that as a deliverer to Israel and not as a, you know, a, a trophy for later that he did, this is what he did. And we got one battle in. Why? Because he did not follow the will of God. He did not submit to it. He let his flesh determine for him what he would do and what he wouldn't do. He rejected the counsel of his parents. He would not listen to them. And because of that, it cost him ultimately his own life. Yeah, but he got, he got right before he died. Yeah, that's, and I'm glad he got right before he died. But you know, why die early when you can live a long life and still do the will of God? Say, help me. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 15. Y'all get anything out of this? A one amen, two grunts. I think I heard four help me Jesus is in the spirit. Verse 1. Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 1. Also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts. I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly, listen to this, underline this, utterly destroy all they have. Spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And, and Samuel gathered the people together and numbered them in Telema, 200 thousand footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. He took 210,000 soldiers out to wipe them out. Now what were they told to do? Anybody remember? Utterly destroy them. Wipe them out. Why? Well if you've watched The Walking Dead you know why. They'll come back and bite you if you don't. Anyway little, you know, or eat you. Anyway. And Saul came down to the city of Amalek and lay, waste, lay wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go depart, get you down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them, for you showed kindness to all the children of Israel. Now they, they had helped them in a time, so he's gonna let, he's, they, they get some payback on this. And uh, they took off. And verse 7 is small. Is small. And Saul smote the Amalekites uh, and from Hiva. Until thou comest to Shur over against Egypt. Listen to this now. And he took Agag, the king of the Amorites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Now, wait a second now. Did Saul, Samuel tell him anything about taking Agag? No. Not a word. You know why? Because he's thinking he's going to get some treasure somewhere because Agag knows where it's hid. You know, pull Jack Bible and get a little information that I might be rich. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refused, they, they uh, destroyed others. Now listen, God did not say 
Go get the best stuff and get rid of the bad stuff. Anybody can figure that one out. He didn't say keep the king alive. He said wipe it out. Why? Well, wouldn't God, the Lord would want me to have the good stuff. See, you start thinking instead of obeying, you'll get in trouble. Now, you might think it's a biblical principle that God wants to prosper you. And, this, and this, I remember a number of years ago, probably about 20 years ago now, there was this telephone car going around. And everybody was, I mean, all the, all the churches were getting into it, you know, and getting the pastor into it and getting everybody in the church into it. And they were all going to get rich. This was God's, it's always God's method of prosperity. And somebody told me, yeah, the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. I said, what's the break point? We said, what do you mean? I said, when... Do you stop losing money and you start making money? Where in the pyramid does that happen? Top 11% make money. Oh, that means out of 100 people, 89 got to be the sinners. Because of the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. The bottom 89 have got to be sinners. The top 11 have to be the Christians. Because you just said the wealth of the sinners is laid up for the just. There can't be one Christian down there in that 89. Why? Because you said the wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. They didn't like me. See, I don't mind to be manipulated with scriptures. People using Bible principles to manipulate you into something that's not biblical. Amen? And just because, you know, you know, well, God wants us to eat the good of the land. But you know what? Sometimes the good of the land doesn't come when you think it should and doesn't come from where you think it should. And they thought here, they're going to eat the good of the land by going out and keep it. And this wasn't real, this was, this was pure carnal because they got rid of all the stuff that was bad and kept all the stuff that was good and then said we obeyed the Lord. What you been smoking? Anybody would have done that. Sinners would have done that. They'd have thrown out the bad stuff and kept the good stuff. Come on now. Now God said get rid of it all. Why? Number one, he's our source and he's our, he's our supply, not them. But see, we'll get, we'll get real cute and start, you know, justifying disobeying God. Do you know where that comes from? To justify disobeying God? He took it to a high pinnacle and said, cast yourself down from here. For it is written that his angels shall bear thee up, lest thou cast, dash thy foot against the stone. See, the devil uses scriptures against you to get you to disobey God. But Jesus said, it's also written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. I said, amen. And so, you know, you know, Samuel does this. And the Lord repents for making him king. And then um, he gets down there. Verse 13. Samuel shows up the next day. So I go, hey, Samuel, baby. I did exactly what the Lord said to do. And Samuel goes, yeah, brother, you're in the grace. God's so forgiving. It's not what he said. He says, what means this bleeding that was of the lambs in mine ear? In other words, if you did what the Lord told you to do, where, why am I hearing the sounds of, of, of sheep bleeding? Hello? And uh, Saul goes, well, uh, they brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to, to sacrifice. Now he's going to spiritualize it. To sacrifice to the Lord. Yet, yeah, God wants your disobedient, wants to sacrifice from your disobedience. No, he doesn't. He wants your obedience. Because Saul, Samuel tells Saul in this time, he says to obey is better than to sacrifice. To obey is better than to sacrifice. See, he thought if, he could sac if they sacrificed it, that would get them out of the hot, hot water because they disobeyed God. What God says is, obey me first. You won't be in the hot water. But see, in, in all of our circles, in our, in our charismatic prosperity circles, it makes sense to take all the good stuff and say, well, look what the Lord blessed me with. Not if he told you not to do it that way. Hello. Because you see, sin or disobedience always has a string attached. Y'all hear you go home. Verse 22, uh, Samuel said, that the Lord has great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. 
Behold, to obey is better than the sacrifice and to hearken better than the fat of rams. Can I say something today right here at this point? Submitting to the will of God no matter how much your flesh doesn't want to will always bring you in to the right place and the good place. But I can also say this. Disobeying God and refusing to submit to God will bring you into a land of trouble and turmoil and destruction. That's why we have to obey God. Everybody say, I have to obey God. Say, I have to be submitted to God. Sometimes being submitted to God doesn't look as good as not being submitted to God. Like I shared with you earlier, you know, um, when Paul and them were heading out, and they, they were heading over into, to, I think, Galatia, and, and, and the Lord forbade them to go by the, by the Holy Ghost. Now, I know Christians, they were, they were taking that one and said, no, 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 it's never wrong to go preach the gospel. It is if God told you not to go there. It's not wrong to preach. It's wrong for you to go do it. Maybe it wasn't time for you to show up over there. Maybe somebody else needed to be the one that went over there. Paul, he did end up in the Galatia region, but he didn't end up then. Why? I don't know. Why. Maybe, maybe he, would have been, he would have been killed. Well, uh, he got sown left for dead one time and didn't get that. Yeah. But he was walking where God wanted him to at the time. So you get out in disobedience and disobeying God, and some things don't always go right for you. You know, what, what's the first commandment we promise? Children, oh, you obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest, come on, thou mayest live long on the earth. Thou mayest live long on the earth. What do you mean you obey your parents? See, honoring your father and mother, listen to the counsel and the wisdom that came from out of heaven, is good. God, and God will bless that. Now, I'm not, listen, you've got to understand, in the Lord. You can't, you can't listen to a drunken, you know, sailor. Somebody had a Ronald Reagan, Reagan quote out there the other day. and said, you know, um, what, what, what did it say? Uh, Said the government, the government will spend money like drunken sailors. He said, but that's an insult to drunken sailors. They spend their own money. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> but see, honoring your father and mother will bring blessing on your life. Amen. They have wisdom from heaven. They hear from God. They know things just because they've lived it out. So we need to teach our children to, to obey the parents and teach them. This is the first commandment with promise. It'll be well with you, and you'll live long on the earth. Samson didn't listen. And let me say, in that culture, especially in that culture, even when the parents are older and the kids are older, the parents are still highly regarded with great wisdom. Eastern culture. Israel was Middle East, but it's still Eastern mindset as far as those things. You go to Eastern cultures, and the, the elders are highly esteemed. In America, we, we are the ones who treat old people like they're stupid. Yeah, I got to say last week, I know more than you'll ever know about the Bible. I say, I say, I say, boy, you bother me, son. You bother me. Amen? Sit down. Sit, sit down and listen to, to old Foghorn here. Praise the Lord. Samuel had to rebuke Saul. And he, had, he, lost his king, he lost his kingdom. He ultimately lost his kingdom to David. But he also lost his mind in the process. Remember, so remember how many times that uh, Saul tried to kill David? Why? What was the reason? He had a devil. Saul, Saul even got so bad he went, to a, he went to a necromancer to have Samuel brought back to speak to him. Hello? Tried to kill. David would come in and play and get the, evil, the devil off of him for a little bit. And as soon as he stopped playing, the devil would get back on him. He'd throw a spear at him and try to kill him. Hello? Why? Because he did not submit to the will of God. Now, let me say something. I want to ask you something. Whatever good he got, whatever momentary, temporary prosperity or whatever, he got out of that disobedience. He lost him more. 
That's why I'm saying we need to say submitted to the will of God, the plan of God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, you know, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Why? Because the part of you that has a hard time with submitting to God is your flesh. Your flesh, look at that woman and say, ow, I got to have her. Anyway, I guess a little Marvin Gaye going on here this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, your, your flesh will say, I want to, but I'm comfortable. And God would take me out of comfort and put me in tough. Really? God took Jesus and put him through the cross. And the Bible says, who for the joy, Hebrews 11, that was set before, or 12, he, Hebrews 12, 1, 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured that shame. See, what was the joy? The reward of the obedience to God. He obeyed God. He submit. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane was his hour of submission. He said, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. And then he went. See, now we use this as a prayer on everything in the church. And it wasn't. It was a submission prayer. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane came into the will of the Father. when He, went, he didn't want to go through the cross. He had to have his Gethsemane moment in order to go through the cross. So that, Remember this? And as he went before them, he opened not his mouth as a lamb before the shearer. He just shut up. Why? Because he had submitted to the will of God. He's going through the will of God. Why? Because on the other side is the joy of fulfilling the purpose of God. He had to go through what he went through so he could restore humanity back to the Father. He is our example. There are going to be things God asks you to go through or to do in order to fulfill his will. And it ain't always going to be hunkadory. Well, you ain't a real charismatic word of faith preacher. I'm as much as there ever has been. The fact of the matter is that walking out the will of God will not always be easy. And, 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 and the biggest place you're going to have the hard time is with your flesh. Your flesh is going to scream, kick, squall, and bawl. Your flesh is going to say, if God was talking to you, we wouldn't be going through this. Well, Peter and Barnabas, Peter, Paul and Barnabas sitting in that jail with their backs whipped and bleeding. And they had a vision to go there. But then the jailer came in when they got to singing and praises at midnight. And the foundation shut and the jail doors opened. And they didn't even get up and leave. They are having such a good time with the Lord. And the jailer sprung in and was about to kill himself because he knew if they got out, he was going to be a dead man. And he said, do yourself no harm. We're still here. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your whole house will be saved. And history teaches us that guy became the first pastor of the Ephesus, Ephesian church. And Paul started a work in Ephesus that lasted throughout his entire ministry, even afterwards, where he, was, he, he came through there, and that was part of his travels, was going through Ephesus and ministering. Now, to get to that point, he had to go through the, he, he ended up going through the, 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 the scourging and, doing, and, and, and obeying God, and it didn't look like it may be God. There's going to be times you're going through stuff that don't look like God. But you just got to stay submitted to God. And you'll have, you'll have, people in the word of faith circles, and I'm, I'm, a, word, I'm a rainbow guy. All right? But they'll come tell you that because you're going through that, God's not in it. Well, why don't you go tell Paul that? Hello? He gets over there in the book of Corinthians to the church at Corinth, and I believe the second book, and starts writing all this stuff about all the stuff he went through to obey God. Perils in the city, perils in the country, perils of his own countrymen. I mean, three days and nights in the deep. I mean, you know, three times he received 40 stripes, save one. And he just goes on and fastings often and hungers often, you know, and nakedness often. He just goes on and on and on and on and on. Listen to all that stuff. Now, I'm not trying to teach you that you're supposed to suffer. But I am telling you, there are going to be times when you're obeying God. You can't judge whether you're in the will of God or not because of the circumstances. See, now we do it all the time when everything's good. Woo, we're right in the middle of the will of God. Something starts going bad. What you done wrong? Come on now. It can't be that when it's good, it's God. And when it's bad, it's not God. No, you've got to know from walking with God when you're walking out the plan and purpose of God, not by how your circumstances are. While we look not at the things which are seen, your circumstances... 
For the things which are seen are temporal. That means subject to change. That good can be bad tomorrow. And that bad can be good tomorrow. But at that which is unseen. What's unseen? The word of God. It's eternal. For the things which are not seen are eternal. Eternal. God's word never changes. Being led by the Holy Ghost never changes. Your circumstances will fluctuate up and down. Listen. Five years ago, if you told me we, we would be going through some of the stuff we've gone through financially and church growth-wise, I would say, no, we're, we're faith people. No, my faith has gotten tested. Why? Because we're having to believe God to make it. But we're here. I said we're here. We're above only, not beneath. We're the head, not the tail. We go over, not under. Well, it looks, and Brother Hagin used to say, and it looked like I was going to do all of them. <laughs> Hallelujah. What, go under? Be the tail, be the bottom, I mean the whole thing. Look like I'm going to do all of them. But you see, but you see, in the end you win. I said in the end you win. If you'll say, say submitted to the will of God. Amen. So keep your flesh under. So make us living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. and He'll exalt you in due time. If he tells you to cut something off, cut it off. I'm not talking about your arm. I'm talking about things in your life. The Bible says, lay aside the weight and the sin that does easily beset us. Did you know weights are not sin? They're not sin. Weights are things that hold you back. See, lay aside the weight and the sin. See, there are things that are sinful. You lay that aside, that's automatic. That's what you used to do that. But there are things that are just weights. Golf five times a week. Golf at all. Just, just, just. Does you know how, how quick they back off? Video games all the time. Hello? Don't you, don't, don't do elbows. No elbows. Jane Austen movies. Anything that keeps you from pursuing God to the degree you need to pursue God and being submitted to God is a weight. It can be activities. It can be recreation. It can be people. It can be all kinds, but they're, they're weights. They're not sin. They're weights. And they're, they may, and listen, that all those things may not be a weight to another person, but they're a weight to you. You lay it aside. Why? Because when we say submitted to God, we want God's plan out. We want to walk with God. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.